Welcome back, BC Calc students. Mr. Record here, going to take a look at our third example with our topic 10.1. The focus now is about finding the limit of the sequence. And it's probably likely that you're starting to see a little bit of calculus creeping in the idea of sequences. So let's take a look at limits of sequences. We start off with more or less a definition here in the green box. And this definition says you're going to let L be a real number. We can say that the limit of a sequence, a sub n, is L, and we can write it as our typical limit notation. Limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n is equal to L if the terms in the sequence approach this unique number L as n increases. So really, nothing different than our standard limit idea. If this limit L of a sequence does indeed exist, then we're going to start using some different language and we're going to say that this sequence will converge to L. If that limit does not exist, which predominantly means that you would get an infinity or negative infinity answer, then that sequence will diverge. Lots of language there that you've already used if you think back to improper integrals and the like. Now our formal theorem for the limit of a sequence looks like this. Let L be a real number, and let F be a function of a real value such that the limit of a function as X approaches infinity is equal to L. Well, what does that have to do with sequences? Well, if <clears throat> the sequence A sub N is such that F of N is equal to A sub N, <coughs> excuse me, for every positive integer N, then we can just use a slightly different version of this limit. And this different version of that limit is the limit of a sub n as, and I think I probably ought to make sure that this is written a little bit more clearly. Let's let that be an n approaches infinity. All right, what we're saying here is this sequence is just really a group of these finite numbers. The function f of x, if it behaves much like the sequence, is basically going to fill in the gaps with infinitely many numbers to make a nice, smooth, continuous array of numbers. So we're basically saying that we can apply the same rules for finding the limits of functions as we can to finding the limit of a sequence. And that's going to make our job easy because we've done a lot of work with limits. Why not use that work in this different environment? So that's where we're going with this. So let's take a look at our example three. It says for each of the following sequences, write out uh, the first four terms. And if you believe that the sequence will converge, make a conjecture about its limit. If the sequence appears to diverge, you want to explain why as well. And we're going to assume that each sequence has a beginning index of n equal 1 and is defined infinitely. So first things first, for this sequence a sub n is negative 1 to the n over n squared plus 1, let's write out our terms. You might look at this sequence and think it looks familiar from a previous example, but I think it's slightly different than the one that we saw before because there is no n in the numerator. So a sub 1 would be negative 1 to the first, which is negative 1, over 1 squared plus 1, which is 2. So we have a1 is negative half. a3, or a2, I'm sorry, negative 1 squared is positive 1. 2 squared plus 1, of course, is 5. A3 is going to be negative 1 over 10. And finally, A4 is back to positive, and 4 squared plus 1 is 17. So now the question is, what does this series, or I'm sorry, this sequence do? If we were to let the n get super big, so we're going to make this conjecture. What is the limit? of negative 1 to the nth power over n squared plus 1. Well, what we notice here is that this limit sort of approaches this idea of a fraction. And this fraction is going to have a numerator that's going to kind of be a little bit uh, undecisive, let's say. It's going to just fluctuate between positive 1 and negative 1. 
but this denominator that we see as n gets really big is going to grow and grow and grow to be something absolutely huge. So huge that it really doesn't matter if the numerator is a negative one or a positive one because we're going to get something that's awfully darn close to zero. And that's what we're going to say that this thing does. It converges to zero. So as you can see, you're using a lot of the same knowledge set that you used at the very beginning of Calculus AB with limits. And trust me, you're going to continue to do that a lot all throughout this entire unit. Let's take a look at Part B. Part B is certainly a, 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 a different looking kind of a, series, a sequence with cosine of n pi. So let's see what we have. B1 would be the cosine of 1 pi, the cosine of pi, and that of course is negative 1. And this one, I might write out the, the work just so that we can see the behavior since this is a little bit of a different sequence that we've encountered. Now if we let b uh, in, I'm sorry, b2, we're looking at the cosine of 2 pi. Well, if you think about your graph of cosine, it dips below the x-axis, comes back up, and finishes at a value of positive 1. We continue that same line of thinking. The cosine of 3 pi is negative 1, and the cosine of 4 pi is going to be back to positive 1. So based on that and the idea that we can take the limit as n approaches infinity of this expression cosine of n pi, we have to come to the conclusion that this thing is just going to alternate between 1 and negative 1. And because of that crazy alternating idea, we can't possibly expect this to converge to anything. And therefore, we could say that this limit does not exist, which means we diverge. Again, if a limit doesn't exist, or if a limit approaches infinity or negative infinity, diverge is always going to be your conclusion. All right, let's take a look at part C. Part C's got another interesting little function here, a little uh, uh, sequence. So C1 would be 4 times 1 cubed, which is 4, over 1 cubed, 1 plus 1, which is 2, and of course we can simplify that to be 2. So pretty easy start with this one. Let's see if that continues. If we let n be 2, 4 times 2 cubed, that's 2 to the third power, which is 8, multiply by 4, you get 32. In the denominator, 2 to the third is 8, plus 1 is 9. So you have 32 ninths which I'm going to go ahead and help you out, and let's convert this to a decimal to about three places. I quite understand that you know how to use a calculator to divide, so I'll do this work for you. If you want to confirm, you're more than welcome to do that. So that's about 3.555. If we continue this process and find C3, things just get a little tougher for us because now we have 4 times 3 to the third. 3 to the third is 27. 27 times 4 is 108. Double 27 twice, you'll get 108. Our denominator, 3 cubed, is 27 plus 1 is 28. Well, again, this number might be a little hard to relate to because it's so improper. It's an improper fraction. So if we convert this, we would end up with, I would say, something along the lines of 3.857. And you can confirm that. And then I'm going to find the fourth term. I don't even have room to put that in my box here. So I don't know. This one might be even tougher. 4 to the third power. 4 times 4 is 16. 16 times 16, what is that, 256. 
256 times 4, I want to say that that's 1,024. But it's probably likely at this stage we're going to resort to using the calculator pretty quickly. 4 to the third is 64 plus 1 is 65. And I believe if this division is performed, uh, we would get uh, something along the lines of 3.98. Let's double check this. 4 times 4 cubed, 4 to the third power is 64. 64 times 4 is nowhere close to 1,024. I was teasing you guys. 64 times 4 is 256. I was messing with you. That's why we use a calculator. But I do know that this decimal value is correct, and that's what I'm looking for. All right, I'm just seeing if you guys are staying awake while you're watching the video. So let's go ahead and go to our limit. We're trying to make a conjecture of what this limit's going to be. And it's possible, maybe you could make that conjecture based solely on what you see with the first four terms. Well, I moved from 2 to 3.5-ish to 3.8-ish to 3.9-ish. Hmm, I'm getting bigger, right? But am I getting bigger so that I'm like out of control big, like approaching infinity big? Or does there seem to be some numerical value that I might be approaching? Well, that's what's wonderful about our idea of limits. We remember that if you're taking the limit of a rational expression where the degree on top and the degree on bottom match like they do here, they're both to the third power, then you could just simply divide the coefficients and that would be your limit. This limit is undoubtedly four. And because of that, we can say that this sequence does indeed converge to four. It doesn't matter how big we make this n, we're just gonna keep getting a value here closer and closer and closer to four. Last one, part D. This is a good one because it's defined recursively. So the very first thing that we might wanna do is let n be 1. So if we do that, n being 1 gives us a d2 right off the bat, which is going to be negative 2 times d sub 1. Now that's a very strange way to start the sequence, but that's what we're going to want to do with this. Now if we let n be 3, I'm sorry, if we let n be 2, I might want to keep track of this. This is n1, this is n equal 2. We have d3, and that's going to be negative 2 times the term that comes before it, which would be d2. But lo and behold, d2 was already defined to be negative 2 d1. So you essentially have negative 2 times negative 2 d1, which results in a positive 4 d1. Hopefully that makes sense. If we move to n being 3, n being 3 gives us a d sub 4 here, and that means that we have negative 2 times d sub 3. But we've already found d3 to be 4d1, so we just take negative 2 and multiply it by the 4d1, and that would, of course, simplify to be negative 8d1. It's likely at this point you might recognize a pattern. Negative 2d1, 4d1, negative 8d1. Maybe positive 16d1 is where we're going? Well, we're going to find that out when we let n be 4. And indeed, that is exactly what we have. Forgot my negative sign there. Two negatives multiply to make a positive, so we're at positive 16d1. Now, finding the limit of a recursively defined sequence is a bit trickier. And it's because you don't have this nice single formula that you can just throw your limit in front of. So what you're gonna to have to do is look at this and just notice what's really happening is that this negative two is seemingly acting as this multiplier and we just find ourselves growing 
by a base of this negative 2 to some power. And that power is actually going to be an n plus 1 in this case. Now, if that's the case, negative 2 raised to a power, and whether you, you know, to not confuse you, what if we just said the power was n? Like if n is equal to 1, this is going to be negative 2 to the first, and I don't want to to belabor the point, like, how does this equate exactly to this? That's not really what's important right now. All I want you to see is that to achieve these numbers, 2, 4, 8, 16, we're raising negative 2 to a power. If negative 2 is my first result, then I think my power really is going to be an n by itself. Negative 2 to the first is negative 2. Negative 2 to the second would be this positive 4. And we just work on down the line. So what we see here is a situation where we're going to be growing way out of control. We're going to get powers of 2, bases, powers of base 2, that are going to get really large, and then really small, and then really large, and then really small as they alternate between positives and negatives. So you can write that up however really way you want. We could just simply say this creates very large and very small values. Very large, meaning positive, big. Very small, meaning negative and big. So because of that, this is going to force this limit to not exist. So d sub n would likely be this sequence's name if we could write it as a nice uh, explicit. But we know that this limit is simply not existing. And that means that our sequence will diverge. Anyway, I hope this makes sense. We've got a few more things to continue to talk about with our topic 10.1. We're going to get into some application problems and start talking about the idea of the series very soon. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next time.